Quiet. <laughs> Welcome everybody to the uh, first program, or I guess it's maybe first and a half program for the Yellow Springs Historical Society this year. We had one planned for February uh, that didn't happen. We're going to try to reschedule that for later this year, and we've got a full uh, uh, full year for the rest of the year of, of our normal uh, four programs per year. Um, I think this program, for me at least, was one of the most interesting that I've worked on. Uh, David Kaysenizer here, who's our, the co-presenter on this, uh, has known this his entire life, but for me a lot of this was new information, uh, and it, it really interesting information, and it, it, uh, it makes me want to dig further because I think there's more information out there uh, about um, what sometimes is called Roosevelt's Tree Army, the Civilian Conservation Corps, and how they were very active in uh, John Bryan Park during six years of the Depression. And in fact, um, most of what we see today in John Bryan Park uh, is because of the Civilian Conservation Corps work during the Depression. Uh, their work has really uh, lasted a long time. So with that, we'll just launch into the the program here and the story really starts on March 4th 1933 when Franklin D. Roosevelt was inaugurated as President of the United States um, he came into office with 25 percent unemployment in the country um, even higher among uh, youth things were really looking uh, dire dark and one of his ideas and it was an idea to put people to work and put them to work quickly, he had in place by March 31st. So he came into office on March 4th. By March 31st, the legislation had been uh, uh, authorizing, but wasn't was not called the, the Civilian Conservation Corps. It was called Emergency Conservation Work. It was passed through Congress, and by April 7th, uh, the first enrollee was. Uh, enrolled in the in the Civilian Conservation uh, Corps that today is the 86th anniversary of that first enrollee in the, the Civilian <laughs> Conservation Corps. Uh, so it, it was an incredibly fast uh, thing that, that he came that came about and this is his notes explaining the organization because it was a little bit different organization than the federal government normally did. It wasn't, it wasn't an agency. There was never a Civilian Conservation Corps agency. Instead, it was a joint venture or coalition between a number of different agencies. So, in particular, um, there was the Army. The Army uh, provided through their reserve officers, the men who would actually run the camps, the, the camps themselves. Um, then other agencies, particularly the Department of the Interior and Department of Agriculture, uh, would provide the project management, uh, and the uh, Department of Labor would interview the young men that would go into the Civilian Conservation Corps. And somehow they all worked together. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, but in order to uh, become a member, they were typically called enrollees, in, in the Civilian Conservation Corps, you had to be between the ages of 17 and 23, I think later that was extended to 25, unmarried, unemployed, and there was a monthly allotment, so there were only a specific number at any given time uh, who could uh, enroll. You enrolled for a six month period, and that could be extended for up to uh, two years, so that was the maximum period of time. Uh, you got paid $30 a month, and some of you may remember that that uh, these uh, men and others who worked during the Depression were referred to as dollar-a-day men, and that was because they got paid $30 a month. In the case of the CCC, the government set $25 of that $30 back to your parents or back home, and you only got $5 to spend, but you had your clothing in your, your uh, room and your food 
um, uh, provided for. About 14,000 men a year from Ohio served in the Civilian Conservation Corps uh, during the term of its existence, so starting in 1933 and ending in 1942. Um, through the whole program across the United States, three and a half million men served in this, uh, this program. Here was the uh, first director, a, a man by the name of Robert Fechner, and he's, uh, he really put the organization together, did a good job, uh, and then served until he died in 1937, 38, something like that, I think. So, <laughs> This does look like the federal government, but this is the organizational chart um, and for each camp. And so there was a commanding officer who was a reserve officer in the Army and a junior officer. So two, two Army officers or Navy officers at one time, the, uh, the commanding officer at, at uh, John Bryan was actually a Naval Reserve. And you probably wondered how he ended up in the middle of Ohio. But, uh, um, then... There was a, a doctor associated with the camp, typically, and an educational advisor. And I, it, it seems to me, and I can't, I, I haven't been able to, to uh, uh, get, dig all the way into this, but the educational advisor may have been paid by a nif different agency, uh, the WPA, but I, I'm not positive. But, but part of the thought here was, we're going to take a lot of young guys, we're going to give them jobs, so that's the first thing. But we're also going to educate them, and education throughout the whole program was, a, was an important part of uh, the training, um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. I, so, so conservation, uh, particularly soil conservation, um, national parks, uh, uh, that was really what was behind all this. We've got a, the, the, you know, the Dust Bowl of the 30s. There needs to be a lot of uh, conservation work done across the country, planting trees, and that's what the CCC was mostly known for, although we'll see later on by no means was it the only thing they did. Uh, and this little rhyme here um, about the guy chasing the tree. This is what it's like to be in the CCC this came from uh, uh, something that was published in, I think it was 34, 35, the historic, hysterical history, and it mostly just <laughs> m cartoons and, and things, that, uh, jokes that you would think would uh, appeal to uh, 17 to 25 year olds, I think, in a, in a lot of court cases. Um, the projects, as I said before, the projects themselves didn't come under the Army, it came under um, Department of Agriculture, Department of Interior primarily. 75% uh, of the camps were under the Department of Agriculture. Uh, uh, of those, about half were forestry, the other half were uh, soil conservation service, which was started during the Depression. Uh, Department of Interior was primary the na primarily the National Park Service, and including this park over here. Here was actually the projects were supervised uh, by employees of the uh, National Park Service. Division of Grazing, Corps of Engineers, there was some flood, flood control work. Um, uh, there is an estimate, I don't know whether it's true or not, and I'm not sure exactly when it was made, but that, that fully or more than 50% of all trees planted uh, in the United, intentionally planted in the United States today uh, go back to the CCC work. So that's, that's pretty incredible. By, uh, this is a, a logo from one of the uniforms. By 1938, uh, there were 500 projects that had been done in 44 states, uh, 60,000 people a year going through the program, 200 million trees planted on uh, just soil and water conservation projects, 600 million trees overall. So that's, that, that's just incredible. Um, and, and a lot of other kinds of conservation work and, and park work. Well, a lot of the information I found, and this was great, because the newspapers have limited information. You know, they would report whatever they'd happen to report or struck them as 
interesting. They reported more in the earlier years of the CCC at John Bryan and less in later years. Uh, but the camp here, as did a number of them, had uh, a camp newspaper. And it was called The Hui, which, <laughs> and, and it was an interesting newspaper. Uh, it had it mimeographed, but came out once a month generally. Um, it had articles on the projects they were working on, uh, information about classes you could take, sign up for, uh, lots of jokes, uh, lots of stories about uh, the, the uh, angst of dating girls in Yellow Springs, <laughs> uh, because that was of a big interest, and, 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 uh, and lots of just, um, oh, lots of life, uh, uh, life advice, and we'll see a little bit of that later on too. Uh, so the Hui is a great source of information because it's not a complete run, but almost a complete run is available online. Uh, so it, it just is a, it's a great source of information on the particular projects and when they were doing them and what they were doing them that maybe uh, exists elsewhere in the bowels of the federal government, federal archives, and I, I have a feeling it probably does, but uh, digging it out is going to be another project. Um, so you see on the top of here, Camp Bryan, the, the, we've got two things we're, we're, uh, we think about here. One is Company 553, so the, civil, the Civilian Conservation Corps Company, the unit that was here, was Company 553, and that was here the entire time the camp was open. There was a period where there was another camp, or another uh, company that was here for a few months before their camp was ready in Xenia, but uh, uh, for the most part it's just Company 553. And then the camp itself had a number, and John Bryan was SP-16, and SP stands for a state park, so uh, it was in the state park. Uh, this, is the, this is the cover of an issue, and it shows the camp after it was construction, under construction. Um, the first men came uh, from Company 553 on May 4th, 1935, so two years into the CCC. Um, that it was, the company was, had been based in Napoleon, Ohio, had actually been formed at Fort Knox, had gone out to California for a few months, came back to Napoleon, um, and was being moved to uh, John Bryan. Local contractors were actually used to build the camp, uh, not the, although the enrollees did a lot of work, I think. And finally, on June 12, 1935, 171 more enrollees from Napoleon came, came here to live. Uh, they lived in tents until the camp was done. Uh, the, uh, there were 20 that they had left behind in, in Napoleon to finish cleaning up the camp there, and they ended up here. And so usually, uh, through the rest of the, the period of his existence, there would be between 200 and 225, 200, I think max was maybe 235 uh, enrollees at this camp at any one period of time. But think about it, they're coming and going because um, they could have a stay as short as six months or as long as two years. So there's, uh, and, the, and the Hui is always reporting on, you know, 40 men are leaving today, or we've got a new, uh, uh, new group of uh, 30 or 40 men coming. So a little bit about the camp itself. Um, I think everybody knows this man, uh, John Bryan. And John Bryan died Oh, he had owned Riverside, what was called Riverside Farm, on the Little Miami. Uh, he died in December of 1918. Um, tried to leave his farm to the state uh, as a, it was very specific in his will, he wanted to call the John Bryan Natural History Reserve. Uh, the state, though, rejected it um, three times. The governor re rejected the gift three times because he'd also stipulated that no religion uh, could be practiced on the property and, and the governors just didn't think that fit well with what they wanted the, uh, the state to be. Uh, finally, thanks to uh, Greene County representative, the um, uh, General Assembly in 1923, so five years after he died, overrode the governor's veto and accepted the John Bryan Natural History Reserve. 
here's a, a picture. This is a 1931 uh, tax map and uh, shows the location of, of what was then the farm. And you can see, should have outlined it probably. This is, this is Riverside Farm. This is what's now called Bryan Park Road and Grinnell Road. So that gives you an idea of where we are. And you'll note that the park actually, and the farm had actually come all the way over here west to uh, Glen Helen. And now we'll, uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about what happened with some of that property uh, a few years uh, after the story we're telling. Now this, I don't know if you can make this out or not. This is a great, actually the, in reality is a, is a survey map, big survey map that was done in 1926, 1927 by OSU students on a summer camp, engineering students on a summer camp. They did a survey of, of the John Bryan Natural History Reserve. In fact, that's the way it's labeled. Uh, but it shows, so what, we, what you can see here a little bit, this is Bryan Park Road. In the entrance, this is the big barn. John Bryan claimed to have the biggest barn in the world, second biggest barn in the world. He acknowledged there was one in Russia that might be bigger. <laughs> and uh, uh, now he was saying that before he even built it, so <laughs> take, take it like everything else that he said with a grain of salt. And although you can't really see it, the house, um, which would be torn down by the, the CCC actually, um, but was what was designed by a, a fairly a person who became a fairly famous uh, uh, architect in Cincinnati uh, back prior to or prior to John Bryan. But David, you think I'm saying this right? The, the, this is the entrance road, and the camp was basically to the west of that. Yes. Yeah. So we'll see some pictures where you in a second here where you can see the end of the barn and note this this uh, uh, jutting out section that goes to the west. Yeah, t where it tees out. So the camp was, the buildings of the camp were to the west of that, if for reference, would be down toward the Horseman Monument, down toward Whitmore's property. Mm -hmm. So here's, yeah. here's a, a, this is, I apologize that this isn't a, this is like a third generation view, but if you take a look at it, here's the barn, and here's the T on the barn. This is the north end of the barn. And so this is this these two pictures are taken from the water tower of the camp, looking at the the camp laid out somewhat like a quadrangle. Um, there were five barracks. Um, let's see if I've got it. Dining hall, administration building, they had a rec hall and later a bathhouse. And ultimately, an education. But they had two education buildings: a small education building, then a. How large many one. people in here remember the barn? Or could, could go remember going out to the barn? It was. Let me see. Uh, 218 feet long, 130 feet wide. I thought I would. I would uh, not agree with that. I think it's more like about 85 feet wide. That's the dimension. I got him five stories high. So the slates on the roof are 18 inches by 30 inches long. And later on in the year, on the back side, there were toilets on the back side in the corner for the use of the people in the park. And those slates started coming off the roof. So they'd come down off that five story roof and they'd stick in the ground like a guillotine blade. And they finally, Ported that whole side off before they, not long after they, they knocked it down. And, and what, we think it was knocked down in the late 60s? Or uh, the 70s? I don't know. Anybody have any idea when it was knocked down? By, uh, the winter of 68. Yeah, and it okay. went quickly. They A friend and I both turned 21 around that time. And uh, we did a lot of drinking. <laughs> we were driving by there, we both uh, should not have been driving. But, uh, seeing that it was no longer there, uh, it had been torn down unbeknownst to us. Well, the state uh, came in on we a weekend. We were hallucinating or what? <laughs> they, they came in on a weekend and pushed it down and pushed it over. The, the, the hill starts down off that end of the barn, and they just shoved it down there because they were, what the, I think they were afraid that there would be too much argument from people who wanted to preserve it 
for its, its, its historical value had they known that they were going to do that. What I want to know is, did you make it down to the bottom of the hill to the mill safely? Uh, no, uh, I think we just drove back down to Bryant Park. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a question over here. So, so I think it was probably 66 or so. What did they do up there about this? Story? It was just open. There was, a, there was an observation deck up on the third floor. Correct me if I'm wrong, John. Up on the third floor, up above that, it was just timber. It, it, it was timber superstructure. The windows were more for light and ventilation, but there weren't floors up there. But the one end, it had decks. You could walk up to a deck and then look down on the, on the main floor and, of the barn. And John Bryan was, I mean, he's the one who gave Yellow Springs the, the word eccentric. Yeah. Uh, he, would, he, he made a, he was a millionaire. He made his money selling soap in Cincinnati, um, uh, his soap company. And he had, a lot of good ideas, a lot of crackpot ideas, but he was really one of the first in this area to adopt alfalfa as hay, uh, a, a source of uh, feed, and so he, he was, had a demonstration plots for the alfalfa, but mainly he just wanted to be able to say he had the biggest barn in the world, or next second biggest barn in the world. Did he have cattle for the alfalfa? Yeah, he had cattle. He, he actually tried, he tried raising raccoons at one time. Uh, that, he thought, for me, that that would be a good, that didn't last very long. <laughs> when they got out and ate his chickens. <laughs> that's, that's a different story. Did people make off with the big slates for producing no, they just, the garden? No, they showed that, they just, they got that off into the, down into the So they're probably still there. Probably they're still there. Probably, probably, if you walk down there, if you go down there, you can see piles of rubble. Huh. Uh, they also used uh, a number of the foundation stones along what the hill going back down toward Horse Man, the school forest, the Whitmore property, and ultimately the mill. But on the side of the road there, they put a lot of those foundation stones down just to keep people from pulling off and parking in the grass. <laughs> but there's still a lot of rubble down on that back, the back side of that hill. And this area where the is pretty much wooded now, but yeah. this is this is the uh, what the camp looked like uh, in the middle of the quadrangle with the with the uh, right. um, flagpole. I think that's the, the the buildings were all they were prefabricated. They would they were actually the walls made in Mississippi and shipped up here and put together. Uh, and so if you look at a, photographs of CC camps almost anywhere in the country, the buildings almost all look the same, and even within the camp it's hard to tell them apart. But you can see the barn in the background of this, this photo right, right here. There, yeah. yeah, and here, this is the, um, what is, this was the mess hall, and this was one of the barracks, this was barracks number five, this was the re uh, recreation hall, which was sort of in the, in the center of the, the quadrangle. I think we've got another picture of, of the camp buildings. Um, another, the two buildings on the left are both barracks. Uh, now, I could not find any photographs of, I think we got one more. Yeah, here's, this was, this was job call, so they get together and be assigned off to whatever crew they were going to work on that day, 40 hours a week, so it was not, you know, slave labor as far as that goes, um, uh, and they had they, they could get passes on the weekends. Um, they could get passes in the evenings to come into town. They weren't allowed to hitchhike. So I think I was I've got a, view, a picture later on of uh, some of the transportation they used to get into Yellow Springs. Uh, but the, for a while, what was then called the Little Theater, now the Little Art. Uh, would give them the list of the show, movies that were going to be shown and actually had a committee at one point, this made national newspapers, uh, a committee of, of Antioch students and CCC uh, enrollees and, and local people to help choose the movies that they were going to show. Uh, this is, so I started to say, I, I was not able to find any photographs of the interior of our camp buildings, the John Bryan camp buildings, but since these were standard buildings, uh, I have a feeling they, uh, uh, they were all fairly close, and this is a, a, a barracks, and you can see it's pretty, uh, pretty no frills. <laughs> pretty close to Fort Knox Army barracks. 
Yeah, is that right? Only two floors and a double deck in front. This is uh, dining hall, mess hall. Then it, I don't have a photograph of the rec hall, but the rec hall had several people noted it. One of the enrollees uh, in 1936 was a man by the name of Steve Klisseroff, who had actually uh, trained at the Cleveland Museum of Art. And he did five paintings of local scenes that were hanging in the recreational hall. I'd love to know what happened to those. I'll show you one of his drawings in, the, the, in a little bit. That he, was, he was really good. Uh, and the newspapers noted that people would come in, they'd have an open house, and that was one of the highlights was to see this guy's paintings. Uh, this is the uh, uh, where they could go, they could spend their five dollars they were allowed to keep and, and buy candy or uh, sign of the times that some of the, they'd have a little contest according to the newspaper and um, a pack of lucky strikes would be the price. <laughs> so it wasn't, smoking wasn't discouraged. Drinking was certainly discouraging. Right? And the uh, supply room, you can see how nice, neatly the tools are hanging up there. I wonder if that, how long that really stayed that way. Uh, and then classroom. And as I mentioned, uh, there was an educational advisor um, assigned to each camp. There were two different ones over the period, although the, the, the reserve officers in charge changed fairly frequently. Uh, there were only two different educational advisors on this camp over time and they would arrange for for classes uh, sort of basic uh, classes and uh, well we David found some statistics one of the, that are interesting. well one of the things the, the, the differences between the CCC and the WPA the WPA operatives the fellows that were working on those projects were pretty much had skilled trades the young fellows that came into the CCC typically did not um, the average, as we we're looking back here, the average uh, education level of the enrollees at Camp Bryant is nine and a half years. So what they were doing a lot of times was teaching them you know, the basics of stone masonry for one, um, carpentry, that kind of thing, along with reading, writing, and math. Yeah, yeah, everything yeah. from deportment to right. yeah to reading, writing, mathematics, how to use hand tools, which you saw in the picture. So that they, you know, as they moved along, they got more skilled. But they were, there were people who knew the trades, who then were teaching it. And if you look, if you've been in the park in the last 60 years, <laughs> all the stonework down there, all the cut stone, um, for example, that was all quarried there and erected. The shelter houses, the bridge abutments, all that stuff was, yeah, that all came from local, local <coughs> quarry. <laughs> oh, I, I like this just because it's, uh, I guess it's what somebody thought an enrollee, um, like the, the uh, hui, particularly in the earlier years, w would made it make a big deal too when, when uh, kids were graduating, leaving, and what their job prospects were, and, and um, how many of them had something in line for a job. So that was, a, it, was a, it was a big deal, particularly in the early years. Uh, this is a group photo that's, that's uh, I don't think it's that one in the back, it's maybe another one, but I just wanted to show it because this man, who was there as the project superintendent, so employee of the National Park Service, uh, for the entire time the camp was open, his name was Joseph L. Mounts, and he was um, a Columbus architect, like I say, technically working for the, the uh, National Park Service. The the foremen who were also employees of the National Park Service worked for him, uh, but they were the ones who put the projects together, designed the projects, and and had them approved. So if there's any one person who's responsible for what the park looks like today, I think it's probably this uh, Joseph Mounts. He, like I say, he was here the entire time uh, the camp was open. Uh, he left and worked for the um, uh, state as a state architect uh, into the at least into the 1950s. Uh, 
So he was a, a public architect for his, pretty much his entire career. So one of the first projects that uh, they undertook came in and in June, by the time the whole company was here, of uh, 1935, this is in July of 1935, is tearing down the old gatehouse and uh, entrance. entrance, which I don't, I didn't write it down, but uh, um, Brian had a, a, just being the way he was, had a, um, a name for it. Lodge and Gate of Welcome to Brian Manor was what he <laughs> what he called that building, and he put a uh, um, time capsule in it, which was a tin can that was apparently pretty rusty by the time, uh, and it it had his address to uh, residents of the area a thousand years from uh, you know 1899 whenever he put it in, so it didn't quite quite make it. He said it makes comments like there probably is no state of Ohio anymore. <laughs> uh, Interestingly enough, when they tore the arch apart, when they dismantled it and found the, the time capsule, uh, it had some coins in there and some newspaper clippings and they ended up passing those on to the mayor of Yellow Springs. Now it didn't say who who was mayor at that time, but that stuff, and I think... Or what he did with them. Yeah, right. <laughs> I think the archway was up, uh, if the old entrance to what is the campground today, where 370 bends around and starts down the hill, was where that arch was. Yeah, I think, I, I, I they, agree. They, when they started construction of the new entryway, they moved it a little bit to the north and to the east, where it is currently. So, there you go. there's a, um, working on a parking area, I don't think we're sure which parking area this is, but uh, they've got their, their government issued trucks out there, a lot of manual labor, I mean this was, this was not using a lot of construction equipment, it was uh, picks and shovels and, right. and uh, in hand labor, but uh, they took pride in the government. <laughs> in weighing these uh, kids and reporting in the newspaper how many pounds they had gained since they had enrolled uh, by the, you know, the <laughs> good three square meals a day. And hard work, yeah. Right. So I think, if I had to guess, this is probably the parking area that's the first one you see as you come into the park today on the right. And they've since they opened that road that goes up the hill now to the camping area. And, and so remember, the farm was basically an un, was a farm. I mean, it hadn't been improved uh, much at all before the CCC started work. One of their first early projects yeah. is, is uh, shown on the cover of, of the Hui, um, and it is um, Shelter House, House Number One, and it was mostly finished by uh, December of 1930. Five. We've got a couple other photographs of it. <coughs> and so this is in the upper picnic area, the camping area. Really it's looking up to it. Yeah. yeah, you can see it there on the right. Really doesn't look much different today. Now were the newspapers for all the camps called the Hui or was it only for That was a local one. Okay. Yeah, it was only after they started getting more serious, in like 1939, they changed the name to the instructor. <laughs> <laughs> so he also tried to start marching the guys to lunch, and, and they were supposed to be quiet as they were marching to the mess hall. It apparently didn't work well because there were several articles from the commander saying, we got to do better at this. <laughs> That's in the day use lodge, I believe. No, that's the that's that I took that one, so it's it's okay. definitely that uh, shelter one number one. But I thought it was interesting because well the fireplace, but also yeah. the the stone bases for the seats the next to the front. Yeah. So if you think about that, uh, 1935. It's now it's been taken care of, but it's really still solid and, and serving well. 
There's a, they also built the picnic benches, which when this photo was taken are probably the ones being used um, in that area. Uh, the interesting, let me go back here a second. There, you can see the stone floor down here. Whoops. And that's one because of the hui. We actually know that, and these were, again, as David said, these were guys who really didn't have stone uh, masonry experience at all that built this. But um, a man by the name of J.J. Bellison, who would have been a, a National Park employee, supervised the construction. Um, the floor was laid by Sonny Sobecki, uh, M. Tanrick, and Whitey uh, Daly, who were all under the supervision of uh, Louis uh, quite a wit, I guess is the way you pronounce it. Uh, so we actually know the enrollees who built the floor. I thought mm -hmm. that was pretty cool. Um, also, in the fall of, of uh, fall of 1936, they um, approved a 200-acre arboretum uh, in the park and. The assistant to um, Joseph Mounts, the, the superintendent, uh, was a trained landscape escape architect. And he had this idea of, I'm sure there were more than just him, but of uh, planting 200 acres, which had been farm fields, uh, in all native varieties. And they, they, they were going to group them by species so they were um, in, in groupings like they would have appeared wherever they were in the state. So there was going to be a grouping of the trees you'd find up along Lake Erie in Northeast Ohio. And there was going to be a grouping in Southeast, Southeast Ohio. Whether that, I, I don't know much about, the, and haven't found much about the Arboretum. There, there were over 15,000 trees planted in it. Uh, and it's the area just to your left as you're coming in the entrance uh, way, just so the east of Bryant Park, and sort of north of uh, uh, the entrance road, um, how that's survived or uh, um, continued to, you know, to be taken care of or even notice what's in there, I can't really say. That's the area, part of that is the area where the group camping area is now as part of the Arboretum. There's also an Arboretum out at the very far end of the drive uh, the parking lot that would have been out with where the swimming pool is today. And something else that I just thought of as you were talking here, and I, I have pictures of it, and I didn't think to include them. Um, about four years ago, five years ago, they went through the upper level of the park and took down over 300 ash trees yeah. and basically just dropped them. And then they turn people loose in there, you know, free firewood, come and get it. And uh, I took my grandson up there. We spent a day up there cutting wood, but it was, I'll have to show you that. It was, it looked like utter devastation. And you go out there today and you can't tell except for the yeah, stump. Yeah, just the stump, but the, yeah. and the stumps are mostly gone, but yeah. at, at that time there were just it looked like, a yeah, it field was, of stumps. I mean, it was really pretty sad. Because they basically just dropped all the trees and then left. Why did they do that? Ash, they were dashboard. They were dying. Yeah. And they were they didn't want the liability. So there were that's that's all right. So there were four of these stone uh, water fountains also yep. built. I, I know this one's left. This may be the only one that survives. I don't I don't know. So these are all up on the hillside up in what is now the camping area. Up on the upper level. The barn near that shelter one. Would have been up in that far corner at where it's still standing. And then David's favorite subject or uh, yeah, there's, uh, structure. That's the incinerator. This is down toward going back down the hill, back down toward the river. There is a, this incinerator still stands. That was used to heat water and burn trash. And then you have a picture of the spring. Is just well, um, I got to that. Yeah, we'll get to it. I got it. It's I actually yeah. got it out of order. I realized, That's but right. I just wanted to say about the incinerator. It was finished in December of 1937, and the Huey uh, quoted um, uh, some of the supervisors as, "It's built solidly and durably. It will last for many, many years." It's still there, <laughs> and it's still there, still still standing, still solid. Uh, they also said that it was 
they had been burning their trash in the quarry and they thought this was an improvement on the smell that uh, <laughs> they seem to I don't have this. The spring is like two. There's a picture. There's some so. pictures on the counter back here. When we're finished with the, with the presentation, you can look. And there's a picture of the spring back there. And I was asking John Whitmore what he remembered of the water service. How did they get water up on the hill to the camp? They probably had a ram down in the spring. Uh, until they had electricity, at which point they put electric pump in there, and then they were pumping water to the water tower. But the spring is still there. And interestingly enough, there's also a great big septic tank down there. Now, whether that was for the barn, when they had the toilets in the barn, I don't know. I didn't. Well, they, but they built a septic system for the. Uh, yeah. But it's uh, all for there. The camp. You can yeah. See so. It. so. Uh, another of the projects in in, in 1936. Uh, there are two bridges, and I, I haven't been able to figure out whether they were both built at the same time, or one was built in '36 and one was built later on. I, I sort of suspect the the upper bridge was uh, later on after the pool was done. But uh, the interesting thing about th these are drawings not from the original construction, but from uh, uh, a rebuild or re restoration. Uh, uh, there, this bridge is closed, by the way, now, and I got in touch just by pure accident with the engineer from ODNR who is the one who closed it basically but he's working on reopening it uh, doing the work to reopen it and he's been gathering drawings and so he gave me this from 1965 uh, and it still shows because they were taking it out there were these wickets that were located there was a it was basically a bridge over a dam the dam actually uh, preceded the CCC and then they had these wickets over the top of it. And in 65, they were taken out at every other support. But those wickets could be raised, you know, creating a higher dam. And that would, would dam water for a swimming area on the Little Miami. And so that was the original swimming area. Uh, it was upstream of that lower bridge. Um, and, and then that was discontinued. They Well, when they, they built it. Pool, or yeah. pool later, and the Orton pool was originally for only for the Boy Scouts, 4-H camp, and then and the OSS and O camp. OSS and O being Ohio Soldiers and Sailors Home, which was in Xenia, and they had a camp on the north side of the river. I'm sorry, the south side of the river, but could cross at the upper bridge and come down and swim. So, um, so. Yeah. That's that's today. that's the lower bridge. I don't know how that from here it doesn't show up. I don't know. If, can you see that fairly well? A little bit. Or is it dark? Too dark. There's, there's a print of that over on the table if you get a look. look yeah, at those. Because it's in pretty sorry shape. The, Here's, uh, and it's closed. Yeah. Until they can. I mean, they're planning to repair it, but I'm, you know when. But you can see where those piers were taken out. There, even today, it still stops a lot of material coming down the river. In, uh, in the summer of 1966, the state contracted to rebuild the bridge. So it would have been approximately, what, 30 years since the bridge had been originally constructed. And uh, Percy Mercer here in town got the contract. And he had uh, Johnny Whitmore and Buddy Shook, and there was a third guy. I don't know who the third guy was. Maybe somebody in here does. But they rebuilt that bridge. And the reason Percy got the contract was because he underbid everybody. And the way he did it, all the other guys wanted to bring a crane down into down, well, the, old, area. Yeah, down yeah. the old coach road to lift and move these timbers. And Percy said, we don't need that. We'll just use scaffolding. And John Whitmore told me, he said, they take the steel scaffolding out and set it in the river. And stabilize it with rocks and then they'd go out on the scaffolding and set these timbers. <laughs> and they did it during, they built the upper, rebuilt the upper one first and then came down and finished this one late in July, the summer of 1966. So now it's been another, what, almost 60 years, 50 years anyway, since, I, and it's it's in rough shape. It's in really rough shape. It's It needs to be done again. I don't think OSHA existed in '66. No, so and that's part of the that's part of the issue. What what was required in 1966 
Uh, there's a lot more things added to those requirements for safety today, so it's going to be a whole other ball game to put that up. But when you are on there, or were on there, if you stood and looked down into the river, if it was not running real hard, you could actually see the remnants of that wicked, wicked dam that David was talking about. And the Boy Scouts would come down and swim there before the pool was built. The Boy Scouts were camp camping on John Bryan back even before he died. So uh, um, this is the upper bridge. Yeah, it's yeah, it's a lot taller. Yeah, the Scouts had you know, hence the name Camp Birch. It was it's named after Hugh Taylor Birch. You're gonna you're gonna take the go ahead take my story away. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> Did the CCC build that original bridge? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Both bridges. Both bridges. They also did a lot of restoration on the old coach road that is now the trail on the north side of the river. So if you, you know that really twisty road that goes down to the lower picnic level, about halfway down there's the gate and that was the entrance to the coach road. And you can go down that hill. <coughs> And you can walk all the way up into Clifton Gorge on a really nice trail. And when you do that, you can also see a lot of the stonework, the retention work that the CCC did. And, and you can see the same thing on yes. the roads. This is a, an example of a culvert on, on one of the roads that I just uh, happened to take a picture of. But it's, uh, again, the stonework that the CCC did all throughout the park. And I, I think the... The masterpiece is the is this uh, shelter house number two. I, I just think it's a very attractive. This is on the lower level. This is down lower picnic level. And it uh, it has two stone fireplaces, not one like the first one does. Uh, they they had started on it in the winter of 1935, but uh, they reported that the work was slow because that uh, one day in January, um, John Byron. Camp John Bryan reported uh, 29 degrees below zero, so it was a, a, a cold winter. Um, of course, they had their own problems, in, uh, uh, the camp had their own problems in the next winter in 1936 because there was a case of uh, spinal meningitis among one of the enrollees, and so they, um, they quarantined the camp for three weeks over Christmas, and there were articles in the paper about how uh, Santa made it notwithstanding the quarantine, but they would they would drop stuff off, contractors would drop stuff off at the entrance uh, to the camp and take off and then the, the enrollees would go out and, and get it. There's the inside shelter number two. This is, uh, you can see the this is the lower shelter house, and it's that lower picnic area. But you're still up above the river, which you can see back there. But a, a nice stone retaining wall along the the back of that, uh, and and trails all through the camp. Uh, as David mentioned, they in the summer of 1936 they restored a two-mile stretch of the Cincinnati. Pittsburgh stage route, which is interestingly that map we started off with, the survey map that showed the barn, uh, the location of the barn uh, from 1926 to 1927, it shows on that map abandoned stagecoach route. Uh, so that's Another structure is the, the day lodge. We've got a better probably way you can see this. That one's a little bit clearer. Um, this was. Um, Another CCC project. I'm not sure exactly what year this was done, but you were telling me about the table that was. Yeah, and this the building's been added on to over the years. But there's a table in the main. We didn't weren't able to get in there for pictures, but there's a table in the main room of that uh, lodge. That's, what, 25 feet long, <laughs> at least from. Okay, roughly not quite as long as this room. And seven, maybe seven and a half feet wide. It's on a system of pulleys, and you can lift it up into the ceiling. So if you want to use, have the floor for dancing or whatever, I guess I don't know. But if you wanted to have the floor open, you can you can actually lift the table up out of the way. So if you ever get a chance to go in there, it's still there. 
uh, it's, it's impressive. They also did work in their, their uh, to improve their buildings. This is a view of the, of the fireplace in the library building that uh, someone drew for the Hui. And here is my misplaced spring, your misplaced spring. That's all right. That was, I, near as I can tell, that's where they, that was their source of water originally. And this is, again, down that hill behind uh, where the barn used to stand would have been toward the Little Miami River. And it's on the up opposite side of a swale, that uh, chimney for the uh, incinerator is over on the other side, I don't know, maybe 60, 70 yards distance from, from the spring. That spring's about eight, eight feet long, about four, four and a half feet deep, and maybe four or five feet wide, laid up out of stone. And uh, it's still there. Well, it makes lots of sense to have your incinerator and septic system not too far from the exactly. water supply. <laughs> uh, here's that same photograph, but this is a. Uh, uh, now I'm going to show you the uh, Thomas Clifton. Thomas Clifton was the second um, educational advisor at the camp. Uh, he followed a man who I think was more popular, maybe the first one, uh, just based on, on comments in the paper, but. Uh, followed R.G. Winters, who was the original uh, education advisor, and I just wanted to talk a little bit about the, the classes. Here's a schedule of the classes. So they had basic classes, the, the reading and, and you can see basic group, reading and writing and, and really just trying to get them to a high school level, as well as think, typing was a popular class. Um, there were also, I don't know if they show up on here, but uh, photography sometimes and, and some class, uh, um, craft types of things, um, landscape architecture at one point, uh, so all sorts of different things. Molly Gardner was the name of one of the teachers uh, who was paid by the government, but was a local teacher. I haven't been able to find much about her, but she was there for for several years teaching a, a lot of these classes. Any how to talk to girls? Oh, well, just hold on a second. And we'll... <laughs> the, the, the top group column there in a row, is that the, they would teach the classes at those times? Yeah, in the evenings. In the evenings. In the evenings after your, after work, after your work was done. Yeah. Full yeah. day. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and in uh, spring, summer of 1938, they, they had been in a cramped little building uh, for the classes. They built a new classroom, and this is, this is what it looked like they were really excited about. It. They built it in two months. And they also, in addition to the classes, <laughs> Becky, they, uh, here's an example of how to act at a dance. And I don't know if you can read this, but this is what you're not supposed to do. He's got a cigarette, and he says, Come on, dish, let's wiggle. <laughs> <laughs> and then there were, then there were the, the evils of the times. Marijuana, praising drug menace, makes the youngsters wanton and killers. And as I, we mentioned before, social life was important, and and uh, Yellow Springs was <laughs> was about it yeah, for working these camps. Here's here's how they apparently because they weren't allowed to hitchhike. I said they weren't allowed to have cars if they could have afforded them anyway. Uh, but there apparently was a regular camp truck that drove into town, and they're sort of joking out of here and speedball vans who uh, uh, who was the contract driver. So. And, but, but the interaction with local uh, girls in particular uh, didn't always work well. And this, this um, the, the educational uh, advisor actually did this cover, but it was, this was a, a nightmare, it says, ex expressed by Mr. Clifton. Inspirationally, it's, it's uh, the work of a certain enrollee uh, who fell in love with a girl in the village. The lady ran away with a traveling hardware salesman. <laughs> but the, the, his, his uh, fellow enrollees trying to help had assured him that he had at least a 50-50 chance of 
find somebody else. <laughs> and that there were plenty of fish in the sea. Uh, and, so, and luckily, within two days, he went to a skating outing of some kind and met, met two additional, two new girls. So, um, and here's a, a, a spring tribute to the girls of Yellow Springs. <laughs> the flowers that bloom in the spring, uh, particularly white, young ladies of Yellow Springs and vicinity, they bloom in all of their glory. Uh, they also had regular, uh, uh, they had a really nice um, field area for softball, baseball, tennis, uh, all the different sports. and. They played football against. They played football against Antioch one time. Um, they Antioch students. Uh, they played softball with other camps and with the village and, and uh, other towns in the area. So there was a lot of a uh, lot of educational activities. Uh, and then there were the 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 craft types of things that we mentioned before. This is a, a drawing by that Steve Kloseroff that I mentioned. who was there in 1936. Who had done the five paintings that were in the rec hall. This is the old bridge um, at the south end of Clifton that 72 crossed the Little Miami on uh, that of course doesn't exist anymore, but you can see he had, he had some talent. And now we're going to get to uh, Mr. Hugh Taylor Burge. <laughs> so, so, so uh, uh, Oops, there he is. There he is. There he is. Um, Hugh Taylor Birch, who obviously is real, really well known in town because of assembling the Glen and giving it to the college. Uh, less known is he was also instrumental in a major addition to John Bryan Park. Uh, he um, uh, assembled some parcels, and it's sort of hard uh, sorting this out from the newspapers because. Uh, the acres never fit quite right, but basically he assembled maybe up to five different farms, um, sort of north and east of the park along the Little Miami, uh, or just north of the Little Miami, to extend the park by some amount. For, uh, and the, the acreage seems to be anywhere from 200 to 250 acres. Um, and he uh, donated it to the state in honor of this man, um, Edward Orton, who had been uh, a geology professor at Antioch, president of Antioch, was only president for about a year when he took over the presidency of this new institution in Columbus called Ohio State. Um, and, and had been, but he had, uh, uh, Birch knew him when he was in at Antioch and thought really highly of them, so he donated this, this property to the state as the Orton Memorial Park. And it was actually considered for a long time a separate park from um, um, the uh, from the rest of the park. So, so this was, you remember the map we looked at before, this was basically the, the original Riverside Farm. And he donated this property, really almost coming up to the gorge. I mean, the, the area around the, along that Brian had owned along the river went to the Blue Hole and this really extended it up to the edge of the edge of the main gorge and, and north and in exchange the state gave him part of the property over here that had abutted the Glen uh, 37 acres and he gave that to the Glen uh, when he gave the property to the state he retained 25 26 acres he put an easement on, so he, he didn't have ownership, or, or didn't keep ownership, but he, he had the right to occupy 26 acres, which he gave to the Boy Scouts. And that was why the park is known as <laughs> uh, Camp Birch. Huge, yeah, Camp Birch. And at the same time, he engineered this, I think it's at the same brewer, the brewer farm down here, and that property, the state transferred to the 4-H camp and, to, no camp and the OSS No Camp, which is why they, uh, they're they surrounded by these camps. And then he, uh, I, I, I don't know that he actually donated any money to it, but um, just 
go here. That's the blue hole. That's where the down in the gorge. Gorge where the park had ended. But uh, um, he, at the same time, at least as he's donating this, uh, there's this movement in nine counties, um, sort of centered at in Green County, uh, but the leader of this movement was in, in Clark County, uh, to raise money to build a swimming pool and to improve these two camps. And so they raised those nine counties in 1938, which couldn't have been a great time to be raising money, $40,000 um, and, and 10,000 of that was going to um, the, the government to pay for towards this uh, swimming pool to serve both of these camps. And the, uh, at the same time, the state was going to use, or the, the government was going to use the CCC to build the swimming pool, and they ended up. I think they said it cost fifty thousand dollars. So there was there was a fair amount of government money in it too. And then the rest of the forty thousand that was raised by the the um, uh, this fund drive, half of it went to the uh, improvement of the B, uh, Boy Scout camp, and half of it went to, uh, to improvement of um, um, Camp Clifton for the 4-H. Originally, the 4-H camp was on the north side when they first opened it. It was on the north side of the river. And I haven't been able to locate exactly where that was. But the, they were all set to have the first camp, have the first session, and they had this tremendous rainstorm and basically washed out where they were planning to do this, where they had set things up for the kids to come. And they decided maybe to go on the other side of the river, on the north side, because the drainage was better. So that's why the 4-H camp sits up on the up on the ridge, on the edge of the gorge, on the north side of the camp now. But that upper bridge would have made the pool then, but with a not too distant walk, accessible to the kids at the 4-H camp. Across yeah, that so bridge, yeah. across yeah, across right. the bridge. Mr. Orton also did the first geological survey in the state of Ohio, hmm. which is another one of his uh, outstanding feats. And, and there is a monument uh, today to Orton in the in that part of the park. So the swimming pool was going to be 45 feet by 120 feet, 212,000, almost 213,000 gallons in depth of three feet to nine and a half feet on the deep end. It, it, um, work started in uh, April 1st, 1938. Uh, they figured it took 6,000 man hours to build. Uh, and it was, uh, Orton Park was dedicated October of 38, but the pool wasn't finished until the following summer. Uh, June 11th, 1939 was when the dedication, um, they said that uh, 1,080 people today was the capacity, uh, a day was the capacity. Yeah. How many of you remember swimming out there? Oh, yeah. you know, the water was bitter cold. <laughs> <laughs> the pool was spring fed. Yeah. Yeah, we would go from day camp here in Yellow Springs. They would let us, we would get on the bus at Mills House over there where school is now and they would take us out for the, bring your sack lunch and your quarter and we'd, go, so we'd go out and swim and eat our lunch out there the bathhouse was and you can see in the background was open at the top so you had a place to change in there but it was open to the outside world I think this is an interesting postcard yeah. because it's it calls it Cl Camp Clifton pool but it's the it's the big pool at Orton. It's right. not the, the smaller pool that Camp Clifton has today. And that was before they allowed, it, before they opened it to the public. Yeah. Well, although they, from what I've read, they opened it from the public almost from, to the public almost from the beginning, but yeah. only on weekends. Right. And, right. and and the, the kids had it during were the only ones allowed to use it during the week. Yeah. Uh, so that was that was probably the the crowning uh, project for the CCC. Um, although I, I really like this. I think they were making, shortly after this was dedicated, uh, they dedicated, they have this, it was a joke, but uh, dedicated the new tool house. And obviously these guys were making fun of these fancy dedication <laughs> ceremonies because 
Here's, here's the pro, uh, uh, toolhouse dedication program. Reminiscence, the old oil and gas house by one guy, or the oration, gas house gan gangs I have known. <laughs> and then, then the, the chaplain is speaking at the dedication, the place and practice of the new combination gas, oil, paint, and tool house in the lives of Camp Bryan and Rollies. <laughs> And this one's how and why we built the tool house in 48 hours. <laughs> so I thought that was pretty good. You know, the, the, uh, the end of the camp is really hard, and I, uh, there's more research that needs to be done to, to figure out exactly how it ended, because the newspapers reported, because of a budget reduction, there, were, there was a reduction of two, almost 300 camps across the country in 1940. And the depression was ending. Uh, some of the demand for the services of the camp weren't quite there. Of the, the CCC overall wasn't quite there. So, in, on April 30th of 1940, I've got a newspaper report that the the that Brian Camp Camp Brian had been one of the ones that the camps that were supposed to close um, uh, in the spring because of this budget cut but that it had been extended for uh, three times up until May 15, 1940. So it, it at least wasn't closing before 1940. I think what happened, and again, I haven't been able to verify this, because it, it, it was there until 1941, um, is that its mission changed. It probably was no longer serving as a, a uh, uh, a residence camp, if you will, for, for work in the park. And it became this, if you can see on here, it says Ohio and West Virginia Discharge and Replacement Center. And so I think it was probably processing uh, guys going to other camps for a while until it actually closed in, in 1941. But even though it closed in 1941, the camp was still there, and I found a really intriguing uh, article in the Xenia paper uh, from 1943 that needs some more research because it said, so 1943, World War II is ongoing, 75 Jamaicans <laughs> arrived to uh, alleviate the farm shortage, and they were being contracted out to work on on local farms, so what the story was for that, I don't know, and, and uh, they were getting, I think the amount was like 40 cents a, 40 cents an hour for their work. Um, okay, so we're going to end up here, we got a couple more pictures to show because we, we wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the WPA in Yellow Springs, uh, but really not go into a lot of detail about it. Um, the WPA, one of the major things uh, the WPA did in Yellow Springs was, was allow uh, sewers to be put in. Probably not the most uh, scenic uh, project, but, the, but a, uh, um, a lasting project. And an even more lasting project that's not totally appreciated. You can see the Bryan Center, our friend John Bryan gave the property for that, and the steps going down behind it. And looking down, there's the amphitheater. And there's the amphitheater a couple years ago. Um, and in the very first WPA um, round of funding projects in 1935, the Yell Springs School Board applied and was funded for $14,487 $14, and it built the amphitheater, it built a track on the, uh, for the high school, it built uh, walk, flagstone walkways uh, and that, was, that really was one of the very first uh, WPA projects any place in the country. A later WPA project that we still look at every day in Yellow Springs is the post office, which was 1940, so just before the war. And you go around the country, you'll see other similar 
ones for the same reason. Uh, and and uh, WPA put artists to work, and of course this is a, the mural um, in the, uh, uh, I don't know, I was gonna, with the title of it, I, can't, I don't recall, I can't off the top of my head, but it's a, it's a tribute to Antioch because it's the idea of uh, education and work uh, at the same time. And so you've, you've got this pioneer student uh, uh, reading when he's taking a break from cutting the trees down. So. There's an article in the Xenia paper, and I don't have the date for me. The one I came up with was uh, June 27th, 1935. There's an article about the CCC camp, Brian. And interestingly enough, on the back side of the page, there's a congratulations to the village for completion of the library, which is the Board of Education building today. So they were was going on at the same, same time. time. So, so I wanted to end with something that has nothing to do with any of this really, but I came across this and one of the things that, you know, in looking at those camps that were adjacent to John Bryan, I think we've got to do a better job of, of preserving the history of John Bryan, but also we need to, to do something to preserve the history of those camps because they've now been here for 80 years, not going on 90 years. Uh, and, and this was this was past the period that um, uh, we're talking about. But I hope somebody preserves this is, this sort of thing. This is a postcard, and it's from a girl who's attending 4-H camp at Camp Clifton in the 1960s. Hi, mom. How's things? Probably better than here. <laughs> right now, I've never been so bored in all my life. <laughs> Right now, we're getting another lecture on cabin cleaning from the sergeant. <laughs> Maybe this day will improve. It's going to rain, though. <laughs> Love, Mar 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 Marcia. <laughs> Any questions? Yeah. Where was the quarry located? It's down for the, you mean for the, the CCC camp where right. they were getting the right. stone? Down, if you... How uh, would you do it? Okay, if you go up into the parking, the uh, camping area today on the top of the hill and back in the, the back loop, if you look carefully, you can still see where the foundation lines were for the barn. If you stand and face south, so of course man's going to be down toward your, on your right, down that back hill. They quarried stone on the right-hand side down there. That's now they may have gotten into other places. Yeah, but there, I was going to say I know there was a second quarry because there were several quarries. There's a, another quarry that um, was up above the river, mm -hmm. uh, down uh, uh, upstream from the bridge. I mean, between the two bridges, basically. Because to get depending on where you were trying to use the stone, it was easier to. Yeah. Cut it and, and up, you know, closer to the location. I don't know where's Bob. Was there anything over on your area, your part of the? No, no nobody's doing it. Okay. But but probably one of those two places. They had a. They they reported that they were getting a stone crusher from one of the other camps, and they were actually going to haul stone that they they crushed so for gravel, a uh, building stone, uh, to the railroad to to haul it to some of the camps and in uh, eastern Ohio where they didn't have a ready source of stone. So they were actually exporting gravel, apparently. Hmm. More questions? I have one. Sure. Was it typical then when the, they closed the camp, they removed the buildings and everything? Well, that's, that's lead up into the uh, next part of the discussion. And that was, um, so some of those buildings some, uh, were moved to the Antioch campus for housing, which was right after World War II, and the one that I remember was between behind the science building, between the science building and where that um, art building, the big art building, is now. There were others, other buildings on campus that have since gone away that were brought in temporarily. The other thing they did, some of that material went to build Cedar Center out at the Outdoor Ed Center. 
which came about in the middle of the late 50s when they constructed that, probably about 19, I think they started construction about 1951 back there. So they dismantled some of that material from that building, also from the dance pavilion that was down off of 68 on the edge of the big lake there, uh, the Neff property. Uh, it became Glen Helen, but it was after it was the Neff. Mr. Neff had his hotel up on the hill there behind where the Yellow Spring is, and that lake was for swimming and boating, and there was the dance hall uh, right, right below 68. Yes, sir. Those buildings were called the barracks. Right. And there was, there was a dedication to one of them that they called Shangri-La. <laughs> it was a homemade plate, lettered plate that was on a tree stump uh, at the east end of the science building. Well, the tree stump's gone. I don't know what happened to the plate, but that's, that's where one of those buildings stood. Do, do I remember correctly that that was married student housing? Some of it was, as I understand, I think. Yeah. It was also just plain uh, housing for um, <clears throat> men. Because my husband lived in one of those dorms when he was a student. A lot of guys coming back from World War II went right into the school uh, at Antioch, and, and they just there was a, there was no place to, to put people up. So, yes. How big was Yellow Springs during this period? The population of the town. Well, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know what it was during the depression. Um, That's a good question. This would have been a big influx of young men. Though. Yes, yeah, 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 <laughs> definitely. <laughs> there, were, there were over 200 enrollees at Camp Bryant, and they moved around. This gentleman spoke to me before we started. His father was a member of that group, was there for six months, and then transferred out to Yellowstone, or he said Yosemite, Yellowstone Park, which was also a CCCC project. It's interesting because most of the most of the enrollees who were here, from what I can tell, were from Ohio. At one time, there were they mentioned in the paper there were 37 uh, counties and like 60 towns represented by people that were out there. But a lot of the Ohio enrollees ended up going out west. So, and probably population is a population thing. So, but, but most of the enrollees here seem to have come from someplace in Ohio, but not around here. And I guess the population was maybe, I want to say 3,500 in the 30s, maybe 4,000. Yeah, I bet. I don't know that, but that's just, that's a hunch. Could you explain the, the salaries that the enrollees got and how yeah. How much of it went back to their parents? Yeah, thirty thirty dollars a month, and they got to keep five dollars, and the other twenty five dollars was sent home. home. Right. And the I and, and at least early on, the justification was that that's that's what single guys would have been doing is they would have been helping because there there were so few jobs and so much needed, they would have been helping their families. And so this is just make it easier to <laughs> take the temptation away. It's kind of an economic <laughs> stimulus. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, clearly that's what that was what the primary purpose initially was: economic stimulus, you know, jobs, and and also correct a, a conservation problem. What was the? Did, is there any idea what the urban rural mix of the enrollees was? How many came from the cities? How many? Or other farms. I have seen. I can't tell you what the statistics are. I've seen some statistics on that, um, uh, but I think it was allocated by county. So, so at the beginning of the program, I think there were over a hundred from Green County that went into the program. But then, in later cycles, the six-month uh, enrollment, there, the allotment may have only been seven or eight. So. Uh, uh, it actually became fairly competitive. At Plus, you had guys moving in from other, you know, from other counties in Ohio, were transferring them into uh, Camp Bryant. Just to add to that, I met a fellow who um, was a very young man, but a leader of a CCC organization or camp in the Adirondack Mountains, mm -hmm. and the people they had there were all from. Pretty much New York City and other large cities oh, uh -huh. in the east. 
and he explained that a principal motivation for the CCC was that with the very high unemployment and the depression, a lot of these young men were getting into a lot of trouble. Yeah, mm -hmm. sure. They're breaking the law and getting drunk and so forth. Mm -hmm. And so part of the motivation for the whole program was to get these guys out of the cities and out into the woods where they could teach them some, some use. Put them under a kind of quasi military yeah. Yeah, right, setting right, right, to, right. to get them to calm down and not make trouble. Exactly. Yeah. Well, my uncle was. Uh, Came from a large family, but I don't know, eight or nine, and it's not over my head. And uh, he became a vagabond, I think, as a kid. And he was just hitchhiking across the country, then got into the CCC. And then the other real important part of it is it was training to go in, in the Army when the war broke out. That's where they were ready to go. They were all ready to go. They were pretty good shape. We're used to being used to the discipline that you yeah. would have, yeah. and, and, I, and I've read where it was Ed, where it wasn't just the enrollees who were sort of prepared, particularly towards the later years, but the the Army Reserve officers that were running these camps also got training and that they wouldn't have had otherwise in, in running a camp and in groups of men. So, right. they, they one other thing is back in 1989, then the state revived the CCC. And uh, I, I'll give you this article because they came to Green County. And one thing they did was they constructed a small pool barn and restroom and closed an old dump site in John Bryan State Park <laughs> <laughs> in 1986 oh, or something. Like that. That's, it that's that was, and there is a see Indian Mount Park at Peterson Park. That's over 90 years old. It's the only roadside rest area in the state that's still functioning or design still there and, and as we got kind of involved it came back but I had to find more information they do have a National Association of Civilian Conservation Corps alumni and I, I'll give you oh yeah, that was a yeah, 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 yeah. it's an honor that they did those comment uh, regarding Dan's question I, I read that 48 percent of the CCC participants came from small rural cities and towns uh, and then a question uh, did the timber for these park projects was that cut and sawn locally may well have been I it, it, yeah it, uh, there was no I, I yeah but I haven't found anything specifically saying it but it, my impression was that every pretty much everything came locally I mean the stone came locally the timber I mean the, a lot of the tree planting that they did like with the arboretum, they actually transplanted uh, material from one part of the park to another one. Uh, I don't think they had a, a true nursery here, but they had some nursery type operations. It was interesting because John Bryan Park at the time was, um, was part of the Ohio Division of Forestry. It wasn't, there wasn't a, a real state park system and so the Division of Forestry was based in Worcester at the State Agricultural Research Center and, and had been since the, the, the turn of the century. And so it was really a, a Department of Forestry operation. There's a uh, relatively new playground up in John Bryan State Park for little kids. And you can tell that the uh, stones and timbers <laughs> used in that more not obtained locally because they're all made out of plastic. <laughs> there were um, honest to goodness nursery farms in Michigan because we stopped at a CCC, a previous CCC camp there and they had the different stages of the trees and they planted them as, as uh, seeds and got them to a certain uh, growth and then took them out and planted them in the old area. Mm -hmm. So that was um, something that a lot of people don't know is that in the 1920s, um, Arthur Morgan brought in uh, uh, to Antioch. They actually had a program in lumber management, huh. and they brought a, a guy who had <coughs> sold lumber <laughs> and uh, was a professor of this program. Uh, just as a follow-up to the population question, I see on population.us site 
it has a pretty stable population. I have a question out of this. Uh, uh, around 12 to 1400, uh, 1400 from the beginning till around 1930. And then it starts climbing and it hits its peak at, at 19, uh, uh, 1970. Uh -huh. And then it starts coming back down a little bit. But so around 1930, it was 1,400. Okay, so a lot smaller than I thought. Yeah. And 1950, it was about 2,800, 2,900. It was climbing up. So what was the peak? If that includes the students. 1970. 1970 at 4,600. Yeah. Bob, do you have a reason? Including, uh, you, have, you have a way to explain, like, all of a sudden it's just like, why did Yellow Springs start climbing up? I, I think it was the, the college had been sort of quasi dormant for a lot of years and it really started growing and attracting people to town in the 30s. I think that's part of it. You had three industries at that time in town that were directly or indirectly started by people who came to the college originally. And good jobs. Yeah. Good jobs, paid a good wage, you could afford to buy a home here. An expansion and raise of the right your family. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, you've shown pictures of the uh, uh, beautiful stonework there and the uh, shelter houses. There was also a stone house there that approximately eight, ten years ago was torn down by the state. Mm -hmm. Now, maybe that was part of the CCC, I'm guessing it was. And it was used by the park ranger as a residence. Yes. And then I was told uh, that the state decided not to be in real estate anymore. But this kind of, and it was a beautiful house. And I've been in it. I mean, it's beautiful. Um, kind of raises the question is, you know, these are historical structures and historical uh, period in our time. And it, it raises the question, you know, should the state be able to tear down a house like that? Well, and I even wondered, uh, after doing some of the research for this, whether it would merit uh, a national register listing, which would, would at least make the, the state jump through some hopes before they can tear it down. And I don't know what the, the complications are in doing that on state property or whether you can do it on state <coughs> property, but it seems to me that the, there's a coherent enough group of, of things that were done by the CCC, even if there aren't any, none of the camp is left, that that might be worth looking into. Because they don't have, a, when we were kids, that was where the park ranger lived. Yeah. Um, but there's no, there's no full-time no park ranger, ranger, ranger there, there anymore no. now, so there was That's no need why. to have, the, as, if they don't want to be a landlord. So they, they tore that down. But yeah, the that, public could have auctioned it off and let <coughs> someone take it away. Auction it well, away. it was stone, wasn't it? It was yeah. stone. Oh, yeah. no foundation. <laughs> Well, thanks for your attention, yes. and uh, sorry for going a little long. We've got refreshments over. There's also photographs the in the back you can look at, and some bound volumes with all the hooey's in there if you want to look through. <laughs> 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 yeah.